praise the Lord. Today I want us to look at the joy of Jerusalem. We know the city of Jerusalem as is depicted in the Old Testament. The scholars say this was a, a city that began just like a humble city. Just the way we said even Sitam Eldoret began uh, from just a congregation of about 15 or so people meeting at Hafad Hotel. That is the origin of Jerusalem city, right? Uh, very humbling, and then it grew. And uh, the Lord God appointed it as his city. And uh, one of the things that we see and we read in the Bible, um, this was the city where the people of God, the holy nation, uh, inhabited, and the presence of God was also in this city. And people would make pilgrimage to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices unto the Lord to praise God, to fellowship with one another in that city. That city, you know, represented the presence of God in that particular time. And of all the things, that city was expected to be holy uh, because every uh, camp that the Lord dwelt, God demanded that that camp remains holy. The people they are in, it was expected that they also become holy. And therefore, it, ha it has been a city that has also drawn interest from uh, various um, um, religious uh, people, Christians, Judaism, uh, Muslims. They, they have some attraction in there, the city of Jerusalem. When we read the Old Testament, well, um, uh, sometimes it would be, you know, destroyed uh, by enemies. It would be, the, the, and the occupants would be sent into exile, and they would be brought back, and so forth, and so forth. So this is the city that we are talking about in the Bible, Jerusalem. Now, we are talking about joy in Jerusalem. Now, I looked at the uh, Hebrew tutorials, uh, about the, the word joy. Now, joy is a translation from the Hebrew word simcha. Simcha. Whose root is samach. Now, that's ha. It's only the lawyers and the, 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 uh, the, the warriors in the, in the house that can pronounce it. It's K-H-A. Not very many people get it right. So, uh, the word sim, simcha. The root is samach. Now, the meaning of that root is gladness, celebration, laughter, the excitement that we see in weddings or at childbirths. So during weddings and ch during childbirths in the Hebrew community, there would be that immense uh, gladness, celebration. Now, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, now joy is expressed, that simcha is expressed by leaping. Remember the song, hopping and leaping, you know? Leaping, shouting, singing, laughing, playing music, dancing, etc. And the Hebrew scholars say joy is not a motion, I mean, I mean an emotion, just for favorable circumstances only. Joy can also be expressed in challenging times too. They say it's an action word. And they say it's a choice that you make. And when you make that choice, it is a pathway to feeling better. So if you want to keep feeling better, then you need to express joy. Now this word, simcha, is a compound word formed by two Greek, I mean Hebrew words. The word, one word is sim, it is an imperative for put. Remember we said, Joy is an action word. So sim is an imperative for put. And ha is how the Hebrews laugh. Ha, ha, ha. So when we talk about simcha, we are talking about the laughter. So simcha, if you want simcha, just put laughter in that situation. Put laughter in your uh, workplace. Uh, put, you know, put laughter in your ministry. Put laughter in your marriage, 
uh, put laughter in your mze. Then that, you know, you will be expressing now joy. I'm telling you, that's why I love Old Testament, because of uh, the, the Hebrew language in there. Now, of importance, as far as Simcha is concerned, Simcha was a witness of the greatness of God. People would see the Simcha of the Sikh Israelites, and they would know that God had done great things for them. Media, if you could project Psalms 126, verse 2. When the Bible tells us to express joy, it's not for any other thing. It is actually as a form of witness to the greatness of God. Psalms 126, verse 2, the Bible says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. Just by expressing simcha, just by expressing joy, the heathen, the nations, knew, Ismail siwa kawaida, their God has done great things for them. And God wants the nations to know that he's capable of doing great things. And therefore, he uses the Israelites as a nation through whom his great deeds would be known among the nations. And therefore, the, the Israelites, they were commanded that they would be a people that would exude, exude joy. So that the nations, when they ask, what is the smile for? It would be said, their God has done this thing for them. And you know, they will not stop there at wondering what is it that God has done. They would ask more questions. What is it that the Lord has done? Can the Lord also can their Lord also do the same things for us? And in the Old Testament, when people would see what God had done for Daniel, do you know even the kings would declare there will be no other God to be worshipped apart from the God of Daniel? And this is what is expected of us as believers: that out of the joy that we exude, the nations would come to the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the mission field we are talking about. Before even we go to Ngeria and Kimalel, can we begin by exuding that joy so that people would want to come and ask about what is it that makes you people joyous even in the hard, you know, economic times. Indeed, we can still go to, to Ngeria. We can still go to Kimalel and put a smile on our face because the Lord has provided for us and we are going to share. Now, let us now, um, as my working definition, I've talked about Simcha, the Hebrew origin of this word joy. Joy, in our situation, is the perpetual gladness of heart that comes from knowing, experiencing, and trusting God. That gladness that comes out of your heart from knowing, from experiencing, and from trusting God. Nothing um, better can we define joy in our situation. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 12, we come across a city that much has happened. A city that has been in captivity for hundreds of years before. And in captivity, those were years of hardships, heartbreaks along the way. There were threats of hunger out there. There were threats of famine from outside there. Families were displaced and so forth. Pressures from within and without affecting their faith. It was not very easy even out there, remaining a believer of God. There was selfishness, and the restoration efforts, there were sometimes they would be futile. People mistreating others. It was not the best. And now that the temple had been rebuilt, the sacrifices had been instituted, the wall had been built, the gates had been put in place, 
and everything now was in place, there was need to come and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. You remember those that were mocking Nehemiah when he was building the wall? Do you remember one of the key ones that was very notorious? What was the name of that young person? Can we remember them? We'll come across them later. The one that would say, even a fox, if a fox, you know a fox, a fox is not, I wish the person even said an elephant. Even if a fox just stepped on that wall, it will come grumbling, uh, crumbling down. Those were the mockery that the Israelites went through when they were rebuilding this wall. And now, it has come to a time to give God the honor and glory. I'm telling you, the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Now, afar off, thank God, Nema was not there those days. So when the trumpet sounded, the trumpet sounded and people who were far away heard that there's something celebrative going on in Jerusalem. We had a similar situation like that last Sunday. The Lord brought us 10 years. And we actually took stock of what the Lord had done for us. And we were celebrating. And I'm telling you, we were on Hope FM. And that is the loudest maybe we could go. You know, Nema has given us restrictions. If it were not for Nema, there would be a public system there shouting going the other side and shouting going the other side and so forth and so forth. But whichever way, we indeed gave God all the honor and glory. But just before we, we, we uh, even look at how the day went, I, I wish um, that you would allow me to go through what the dedication looked like that gave this resounding acclamation, this resounding uh, praises unto the Lord that is recorded the joy of Jerusalem. Now from verse 27 to 29, the Bible records that, you know, uh, the leadership of Nehemiah with the people that he was with in rebuilding the wall, just before they dedicated it to, the, to God, they remembered that they were Levites that used to be in that place. So they brought the Levites to the temple, and the Levites were expected to carry their roles. Now the Levites are the, like the, the, you know, the ministries uh, workers that we have here. They are the people who led in the praise and worship. They are the people who made sure everything is set and what have you. The temple could not be dedicated without the presence of the, uh, the, 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 the Levites. So they sought them out from their places and they brought them to Jerusalem. They had many responsibilities in the worship of Israel. And uh, the most important of all was to lead people in songs of worship and praise uh, to God. I remember last Sunday, I had those of us who were in the worship team, when Sitam Eldoret began, the, the, can we join the worship team? Can we join the worship team? You know, that is going to bring out those that were Levites to come and be a part of the ministry and be part of this significant thing in the lives of the Israelites. Now, they had to, um, to celebrate with gladness, singing, dancing, and they were instruments that were there. The Bible here records the symbols, the stringed instruments, and the harps uh, uh, have been mentioned here. Now, the Levites were also appointed to use those instruments to lead the people in worshiping God through the singing. And we also have the sons of the singers. Now, when the people had been sent in uh, exile, these sons of the singers, I want to thank God that they remembered they were singers. And when they were exiled, they did not go far. 
They had built themselves villages around Jerusalem. So it was very easy to go and gather them from the villages and they were brought to uh, Jerusalem to sing and to lead people in singing. Now the singers in Nehemiah's day had this close-knit bond by families and also living arrangements. Now there's something peculiar about the people of God among the Israelites. Like those that knew their worship members, the singers, they lived together in a village. They had this close-knit bond because they knew they are a particular people given to singing. Now, and I really want the, the worship ministers here to take note of this. They were close-knit, both by families and also living arrangements because actually Levites also were of a particular a family lineage. And when they were called upon, they just came. Because the job of the singers were to lead people in worship of God. And they had to be, first of all, good worshipers before they could lead the people for worship themselves. Now, in verse 30, there's something also very interesting. It was the ceremony of purification. The priests that were there First of all, they purified themselves. Brethren, even pastors, sometimes they can fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, they need to purify themselves. And after the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, now they purified the people. You cannot go before the presence of the Lord when you are not pure. Because, you know, he says his right hand is not too short that it cannot reach us. Neither his ears deaf that they cannot hear us. But because of the iniquity, it comes and stands between us and God. So the people had to be purified. The gates had to be purified. I don't know how many times elders we have stood at the gate and we have told God we purify this gate. You know, the CC camera caught one, uh, somebody we know, uh, uh, you know, doing something that was not meant for that congregation. Uh, we need to go that direction. The walls were purified. Now, the team that did the purification first was the priests and the Levites, because they could not actively lead the people in worship unless God walked with them. And then they purified the people, that was the next step, and the things was then, I mean, the gates and the walls. The Bible says in the book of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there is need to keep on purifying ourselves even when we come to give God the praise and the honor. Now remember, in the book of uh, Joshua, chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, there is something that we call the sin of Achan. The whole nation was affected. They were defeated by a small nation called Ai. And it was very disgraceful for the kingdom of God to be defeated by a very small village. Now, when God analyzed Achan's sin, he saw that it was a national sin. It can be said it is a congregational sin. The sin of one part of us was the sin of the whole. When one sinned, the whole had sinned. And therefore, there was need for purification, that they may stand acceptable before King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Verse 31 to 43, we are told about the leaders and the two choirs that led Jerusalem in joyful praise. I want you to take note of the following. One, there was the appointment of the two large thanksgiving choirs. The two large choirs were called thanksgiving for a good reason, because praise and worship must have the strong element of thanksgiving to God for it to be genuine. The singers sang loudly. 
they had to be heard. They had to sing gloriously, just as the instruments were. And the people were to lead the singer, to, to follow as the singers led them in worship. Very interesting there. God had made them to rejoice with great joy. And God did this as the singers led the people in singing. Notable there, the women and the children also rejoiced. Now, the tremendous experience of praising God and rejoicing is not a man alone affair. Everyone was involved in that singing. The joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Their testimony was resounded in that, you know, the, the voice uh, and the volume that, was, that went forth. Now, when we talk about the joy of Jerusalem, and the joy is being sounded afar off. Who are far off? These are the nations, as I have indicated. And Akina Sanbalat were there. And Akina Tobiah were there. They were all out there. Now, it is now not the whole, I mean, the folks that were on the walls, but the whole nation of Jerusalem were up on the city walls with musical instruments, women and children. Praise the Lord. Now when we look at that story, it's a very interesting story, that Nehemiah strategically positioned people to take charge just before the final shout of celebration was made. There are those that went to the east, and there are those that went to the left. Both the priests and the Levites took their positions. Brethren, for us to give a very, very victorious shout of joy, the priests and the Levites have to take their position. When you know that you are the HOD, women ministry, HOD, children ministry, you are a Levite of one way or another. This is not time for not showing up. You know some of these apologies, when I used to be the HOD, every, I mean, the thing that I used to dread most is when somebody says apology, apology. And now when apology, 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 apology. Um, and now we thank God for the, the quorums. So if 40% are there, now you can have your meeting. Apologies have not been mentioned in Nehemiah. They were in the village and they were brought. The Bible says they were brought. And the Bible says they came. So they came and they strategically positioned themselves to do what the Lord had called them to do. And no apologies therein. Now, those that went to the east and those that went to the west, they climbed up to the, the, the farthest end. I saw a picture of them up there. And I was like, wow. It was very, very glorious because they had to go up. And uh, no wonder the women were not up there. The names of the priests and the Levites, those are male. But the, the women were not left out. They are there. Hata kama walikuwa naimbia hapa chini, they sang loudly because they were part and parcel of the congregation. Now, um, Last, I think last month I was in Sitam Nakuru and I was looking at the plight of children and the way children are supposed to be the gifts that God has given us. And I was asking us and asking the congregation, in the book of Nehemiah, the children actually participated in expressing the joy. Because it's mentioned in the Bible. The children participated in expressing the joy. And when I was going through the plight of children, I wondered whether the children in Kenya and the world all over have the opportunity or even the sense 
of knowing that there is God and they can praise God and they can honor God, that they can express joy because of who they are. It's only one or two that come for our Sunday services here. You know, vis-a-vis -vis the millions, the 45 million uh, or, or, or about 30 million children that we have in our country. They are relegated and we feel that they cannot even participate in giving God all the honor and all the glory. Today we are not talking about the plight of children. It could be of another day. But when you look at the, the position of, we, of children, you would wonder whether they make part and parcel of mankind that is supposed to give God all the honor and all the glory. And look even at the participation of women that I, I, the, I was speaking in Isitam uh, Kapsabe the other day and I was talking to women. And I'm telling you, women, we have the voices. We have the opportunities. We have what it takes. The Lord has given us the freedom. The Bible records in Nehemiah, the women together with the children came together and they participated fully in expressing joy unto the Lord Most High. So we are not lesser in any way. We are what God has said that we are. Now, the joy of Jerusalem, joy, ladies and gentlemen, is expressible. I have talked about the joy being expressed in laughing, in dancing, in singing. Christians, we are not expected to have gloomy faces. Because how will they tell that the Lord has done great things in your life when the face is gloomy? In, your, in our houses, what type of music are we playing? When you have children ages seven, eight, nine, what type of music is happening in their rooms? Look at their walls. Ladies, have you gone to the walls of your sons when they've gone to school one time, you just sneak in? Who is on the wall? Is it your photo? If it is not your photo, then you are not the, the hero. Someone else is the hero that is, <laughs> oh my, some of the, the paintings on the wall. God help us. So what music are we hearing that is going to help us give God all the honor and glory? When you leave your homes and you are going to the marketplaces, some of our neighbors don't even know whether we work in a supermarket, whether we are nurses in a empty or a uh, th There's nothing to show forth that actually we are experiencing the joy of the Lord. Now, number two, joy is expected of us as believers. It is for the believers to rejoice. The non-believers, those have pleasure. They can be happy. But for believers, with the Bible commands us to rejoice. Media Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says the following and repeatedly says so. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. I don't know how many times always is. But always is always. Remember the definition of simcha. It was not only when it was joyous. Even when there are challenges, there was an opportunity to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. God expects our joy. He expects his people to be living testimonies to the joy of the Lord. How will the world know that it is the Lord? How will the world know that it was the Lord? And then number three, you may be wondering, Elder, how do you express, where do you get the very joy? Where we have read in Nehemiah, God is the source of our joy. The Bible says God made them rejoice. God gave them the reason for joy. 
He is the author of the joy that he expects of us. Now, in Nehemiah, I've just read verse 43. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. God is the one who enables that joy. And he's the joy, I mean the source of our joy. Now, in Nehemiah, it's a very interesting book about joy. Despite the challenges that the Israelites went through, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10b, the other uh, part, the last part of verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is what Nehemiah would encourage the Israelites. Yes, you have, ha you have the challenges, but again, it is given that you show joy. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, Israelites, having had a personal relationship with God, God put joy in his people. God put his joy in his own. It therefore shows that without a personal relationship with our God, then you may not be able to express that joy. No wonder the gloom on your face. You know the Samaritan woman, when she had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the joy could be seen. She didn't even matter that it was midday. She went saying, come, come and see a man. She went running and shouting and telling it all because the joy of the Lord was in her heart and she had to express that uh, joy. Now, uh, the, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says that your prayers are answered according to something um, um, are there. Maybe if you could just um, project 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. First Peter 3 and verse 7. Media team, we need to be strategically positioned so that you also help us in giving. Uh -huh. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together with the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I have taken that First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, off the hook here, but again, um, including it in the people that were giving uh, um, the joyful noise unto the Lord Most High. Now, when we look at the position of women and children, as I had indicated there, there are things that we ought also to consider that would be helping and, and hindering us from reaching out unto uh, 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 the Lord. Our men are the priests, and we have the women and children in that uh, priesthood, and men just to encourage us so that our prayers are not hindered. Let's engage our women and children in this, um, in this endeavor that the Lord has given us. And the last but not least because of time, the joy of Jerusalem was heard far and wide. Now, we begin from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city, yes. But in our situation, God dwells in our hearts. We are the temple of the Lord. We are the dwelling place of the Lord. And therefore, it begins from our personal relationship with God. Now, the Bible says, you shall be my witnesses in Judea up to Samaria. 
So it goes through Judea, and it goes to the utmost as far as where your situation can get. It is in the Jerusalem that the joy is expressed, and then it is sounded far off. My question this morning is, is my joy of my God resounding in my Jerusalem? And when I move out to Jedea, is my joy reaching out there? Is the sound of my joy reaching out to Judea and to the farthest points of, of the world? And this is the question that I would want the Holy Spirit to help us, you know, answer. The joy of Jerusalem was hard, far, and wide. Are they seeing the greatness of God in my life, in my workplace, and wherever I am? May the Lord help us to resound his joy far off. Now the words far off are limitless. I can't even tell how far that far is. But the joy of Jerusalem was sounded far off. 